Good morning, everybody. So it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this breakfast symposium, getting to the gut of the matter, closing the gaps in diagnosis, effective treatment, and comprehensive care in IBS and CIC. My name is Brooks Cash. I am uh, currently the chief of the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston, Texas. And I am joined by Dr. William Shea from who's the Timothy Nostrant Collegiate Professor of Gastroenterology, Director of GI Physiology Laboratory, and the Digestive Disorders, Nutrition, and Behavioral Health Program at the University of Michigan. I left a few things off because uh, we'd be here for another 15 minutes to talk about his, his titles and accomplishments. We're also joined by Karen Turner, who is an IBS patient, and uh, I think she is going to offer us a, a really unique perspective that will tie in very nicely to the objectives of the program this morning, so we're thrilled to have her here as well. Now here are the learning objectives for this morning. We're gonna talk about how to improve the diagnostic accuracy surrounding the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome in general, as well as CIC through patient queries, patient-centered communication, and the use of various diagnostic tools. We're going to learn to apply the evidence-based treatment strategies for relief of IBS and CIC symptoms in patients with persistent symptoms despite initial dietary and over-the-counter approaches. And then finally, we're going to promote collaborative care strategies that facilitate that comprehensive management of these two conditions, including the early initiation of care and optimal long-term management. So we're going to start with a case, and we're going to meet Mr. Stanley. He's a 46-year-old gentleman who's referred from primary care with symptoms of diarrhea and abdominal pain over the past six, or six to eight months. And let's go ahead and cue up the video of Dr. Shea and Mr. Stanley. Hello, Mr. Stanley, I'm Dr. Shea. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. I see from the referral from Dr. Spiceland that you've been experiencing intermittent diarrhea over the past six to eight months. Can you give me some details about the frequency of the diarrhea and any other symptoms you may be experiencing? Sure. Um, well, as you mentioned, uh, this has been going on over six to eight months. Um, I'm the project manager for our company, and I'm out of the office quite a bit. As you can imagine, with diarrhea, that gets to be a bit of a problem. I think at this point I know every bathroom along Route 2. <laughs> um, I've been to my primary doctor probably three times, but not much has changed. So are you experiencing any pain or bloating in addition to the diarrhea? Uh, pain, yes. Um, get a lot of cramping uh, just before the diarrhea begins. Um, but bloating, uh, well not at first, uh, but after my <clears throat> doc prescribed loperamine, um, I actually got a lot of bloating and was nauseous. Um, you know, to make it worse, it didn't really help much. How about anything else? Uh, yeah, actually he, he had me try uh, peppermint oil, which seemed kind of weird, uh, but it helped for a little while. Um, eventually, though, the, the diarrhea and pain came back. Okay, it looks like your doctor has run a number of tests to evaluate your symptoms, including some stool studies to look for infection, um, also a right upper quadrant ultrasound, as well as an abdominal CT scan, both of which were okay. Yep, that's, that's my understanding. Anything else I should know? Have you made any changes to your diet, for example? Um, well, my wife uh, has been reading a lot online about diarrhea, um, and so to start, she bought some probiotic pills uh, and some yogurt from Whole Foods she has me eating. Um, she, she's also worried that I might have celiac disease, so I'm also now gluten-free, which is not fun. How about alcohol or tobacco? Yep, never been a smoker. Um, my wife said no alcohol until we figure this out. Um, although I'm not a big drinker, um, you know, maybe a couple of beers or a, a glass of wine with dinner. You know, I, I really hope you have some ideas um, because I'm really frustrated now. Um, my doc basically says he has no idea what's causing the diarrhea and it's just time to see a specialist. I can assure you that we'll, we'll work through this and we'll try to get some answers for you. For now, let's move to the other room and, and proceed with an examination. Okay, great. So really a pretty typical kind of patient that would present to any of us in the clinical setting, um, presenting with abdominal pain, um, some bloating as well as diarrhea. So a question for you here, what test would you order in this patient, given the information that's been shared with you already? So choice A, a fecal calprotectin and a tissue transglutaminase antibody. Choice B, 
uh, a sedimentation rate and a stool for Giardia antigen. Choice C, a colonoscopy and a stool culture. Choice D, a colonoscopy and a CT scan of the abdomen. Or choice E, I'm not sure. What do you think? All right, so 50% choosing fecal calprotectin and t tissue transglutaminase. Brooks, what do you think about that? Uh, yeah, well, I, I think that's exactly what I would recommend in terms of initial testing. I mean, we heard from his history that he'd already had a CT of his abdomen, but even if we exclude that, as you can tell from the history, that's a very common test that people will offer. You know, the, I think the, the tried and true method of diagnosing irritable bowel syndrome is, is adhering to the symptom-based guidelines that the Rome Committee has put forth, and, and Bill, of course, I, and I have done some, some research in that arena in terms of the value of diagnostic tests, which we'll certainly talk about. But I think uh, the two tests at the top, looking for celiac disease and looking for inflammatory bowel disease or inflammation of the colon, are probably the most useful of those tests that are listed. Yeah, I agree. Um, a couple of quick comments. So obviously, the fecal calprotectin is to rule out IBD and the tissue transglutaminase is to assess for celiac disease. Sedimentation rates are um, neither specific or sensitive in this setting to rule out IBD, so really are not useful. Uh, the colonoscopy, um, a patient's already had a colonoscopy and the patient's had long-standing symptoms, so a stool culture, routine stool culture, is not gonna be helpful. Patients also had a CT scan, so that's why those, those other choices aren't, aren't correct, outside of the fact that really doing a CT scan in a patient with typical IBS symptoms, no warning signs, is gonna have a remarkably low yield. All right, so um, next question. How confident are you in making a diagnosis of IBS? So choice A, not confident. Choice B, somewhat confident. Choice C, confident. Or choice D, very confident. What do you think? Good, so half the audience uh, saying um, very, very, well, let's see, uh, confident. And um, I wanted to t turn to Karen at this point and, and ask about um, what you went through before you ended up getting a diagnosis of IBS. How long had you experienced symptoms before you received the diagnosis? It was about 13 years. 13 years. I and started experiencing symptoms around 22, and I was diagnosed about 35, 36. Well, how many doctors did you end up seeing in that period of time? Uh, I saw my primary care physician, and I'm Canadian, so this started in Canada. Um, so I saw um, primary care specialist, uh, primary care there. When I moved to California, primary care gastroenterologist, and then I finally saw primary care gastroenterologist in Yuma, Arizona, and uh, the gastroenterologi gastroenterologist there was the one who gave me the diagnosis. So what diagnosis did the doctors offer you before you ended up getting, getting IBS? Did they, did they label you as suffering with some kind of disease or diagnosis? No, so I, I never had anything. I did get tested for lactose intolerance, H. pylori, um, multiple times, um, just lots of blood draws, but never any diagnosis. And, you know, sometimes the doctors, I think, would hear me, but I could tell sometimes from the way that they looked while I was explaining my symptoms and how my symptoms had been ongoing for so many years that um, I think they probably, from the looks that I got, sometimes thought that I was perhaps also having some mental behavioral mm -hmm. um, issues as well. That must, have been, that must have been really disconcerting for you as a patient. I mean, how did that make you feel? Well, sometimes you do feel like perhaps you are crazy um, and that perhaps there is something else going on from a mental perspective. Um, the internet, you know, when I was 22 <laughs> wasn't, wasn't as big, so I didn't have as much place to go to research. Um, I'm a registered dietitian now, but I wasn't at the time, and that's actually one of the things that led me to change my career to becoming a registered dietitian is just realizing the nutritional, um, the nutritional impact that could potentially help me. That's where I turned personally, but I did, I did lose faith. Yeah, I think, you know, one other thing that was really interesting, we were talking last night, 
is how this whole thing started. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it was uh, 21 spring break, Acapulco. Um, that's when I came back and I just started feeling kind of the gurgling and I just thought perhaps I caught something brushing my teeth and uh, you know, with water or ice or something and just started going to see my primary care doctor, lots of stool cultures, but never anything. She always said she could hear bowel sounds, but didn't, it didn't go anywhere and I was never referred to a specialist. And the interesting thing about that, of course, is that she had a very specific diagnosis, right? She had post-infectious uh, irritable bowel syndrome and, and nobody ever made that connection. Um, you know, and, and also another thing that I always like to say about post-infection IBS is the fact that the majority of the people get better over time. Now, Karen didn't get better over time, but the point is that um, it would have, would have been nice, reassuring to have gotten a specific diagnosis earlier, to have gotten a hopeful message that things are likely to get better over time. Um, but let's, let's, let's move on. So we're going to now talk about IBS, and of course, IBS is a condition that's predicated upon the presence of typical symptoms, including abdominal pain and alterations in bowel habits. And those bowel habits can include patients with um, constipation, patients with diarrhea, or patients with a mixture of both diarrhea and constipation, perhaps the most confusing uh, group that we face in clinic. Uh, in addition to using the symptom-based criteria like the Rome criteria, we also exclude alarm features or warning signs, and the reason we do that is because there is the thought that the presence of these alarm features or warning signs increase the likelihood that there's an organic basis for a patient's symptoms, so things like colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these things include the onset of symptoms after age 50, the presence of GI bleeding or unexplained iron deficiency, Nocturnal diarrhea. Remember, nocturnal pain is not a warning sign. There is no um, discriminative benefit between patients that have abdominal or, or pain at night between, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, colon cancer, or IBS. Uh, weight loss as well as a family history of organic diseases like colon cancer, IBD, or celiac disease. Now, lately, it's been called in the question the actual predictive value for organic disease of these warning signs or alarm features. But I think the take home message for all of you right now is we should still be assessing these warning signs or alarm features. Now, um, uh, in addition to the symptom based criteria, including warning signs and alarm features, doing selected uh, uh, diagnostic tests to exclude organic diseases that can mimic the symptoms of IBS is very helpful and reassuring, both to the patient as well as you. And so um, those things would include it for IBSD in the red, you can see, uh, a complete blood count, a CRP or a fecal calprotectin. Let me just tell you, that's based upon data that I'll briefly review from a systematic review meta-analysis that um, colleagues and I published a, a couple of years ago now. Um, the AGA has actually just recently completed a systematic review, a meta-analysis on this topic, which will be submitted for public comment probably within the next week or so. And it turns out that fecal calprotectin and fecal lactoferrin are probably the two best tests to screen for inflammatory bowel disease uh, in patients with IBSD-like symptoms. Also, um, screening for celiac disease with a tissue transglutaminase uh, combined with either a quantitative IgA or an IgG-based um, celiac antibody test. Uh, screening for bile acid diarrhea, very interesting story that's starting to um, pick up steam. Uh, and those tests are starting to become available in the United States, either stool testing for quantitative bile acid determination or a serum C4 level, which is uh, an important uh, metabolite, a bile, bile acid metabolism. Uh, and then finally, uh, colonoscopy. And really, we're talking about age-appropriate colorectal cancer screening. And if you do a colonoscopy in somebody that has diarrhea-predominant IBS symptoms, obtaining random biopsies to screen for microscopic colitis uh, is very useful. So realize that there's a lot of colonoscopy done in patients that have IBS symptoms uh, and no warning signs or alarm features. The good news is uh, that the, the likelihood of finding uh, a serious organic disease like colon cancer or inflammatory bowel disease is really low actually less than 1%, which is no different than the general population. 
Um, you know, I think you could certainly make an argument to do, uh, particularly a patient with severe diarrhea, to do one colonoscopy, but it doesn't make sense to do colonoscopies over and over again, as is often the case uh, for patients with, with symptoms like Karen. Uh, also, um, again, using non-invasive tests to screen for inflammatory bowel disease can offer a lot of reassurance to you and the patient that that's not, it, that's not what's causing the symptoms. So again, just to summarize, fecal calprotectin, fecal lactoferrin, probably the two best tests. CRP is a, a poor man's surrogate for those tests. All right, so let's move to treatment. And first say that uh, this is a study that's, that's a bit older now, but it's, it's actually kind of shocking when you look at this study because if you look at the proportion of patients who are extremely or very satisfied that had IBS that responded to this survey, look, it's less than 10%. Even if you include those that are somewhat satisfied, it's less than 40% of IBS patients um, that reported feeling somewhat satisfied, very satisfied, or extremely satisfied. So a, a lot of confusion, a lot of dissatisfaction with the treatment options, at least circa 2009 for IBS. Another thing that, that on the slide is really shocking is look at that second bullet. IBS patients would give, give up 25% of their remaining life, an average of 15 years, or 14% would risk a 1 in 1,000 chance of death for a treatment that would eliminate their symptoms. If there's any doubt in your mind about the impact of these symptoms on severely affected patients, this should really dispel that doubt. Um, this has been a consistent finding now from several studies, not one study, it's several studies all showing the same thing, which is that these symptoms dramatically reduce quality of life and have a huge impact on patients' well-being and ability to function. Um, how about diet? Well, there's certainly a lot of attention being paid to diet, including at this year's DDW. There's a lot of abstracts on diet. And look at the data from this survey. 90% of IBS patients versus 55% of controls reported uh, at least one food intolerance. Uh, and you can see that, that things like cereal, spicy foods, uh, vegetables, uh, fatty foods were all implicated as culprit foods. 92% versus 40%. 46% said that they had at least one dietary restriction. So patients oftentimes associate their symptom experience with eating food. Uh, and right now, the 800-pound gorilla in the room in regards to diet therapies is the low FODMAP diet. Realize that um, there are probably seven or eight randomized controlled trials that have evaluated the efficacy uh, and effectiveness of the low FODMAP diet versus some controlled diet. In fact, one of the posters that our group, along with Paul Moyetti, Alex Ford, and others, is presenting at this meeting is a meta-analysis of the, of the randomized controlled trials evaluating gluten-free diets and the low FODMAP diet in patients with IBS. There is data to support the efficacy of the low FODMAP diet. There is not high-quality data to support the efficacy of the gluten-free diet. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that we can't say that it works or doesn't work to the same degree of confidence that we can for, like, for example, the low FODMAP diet. This is the data from the United States in adults, uh, a, U, a U.S. Um, uh, single center study from our, our particular site, uh, evaluating the low FODMAP diet versus usual dietary recommendations and showing the most robust benefits for abdominal pain and bloating. That's been a very consistent theme from all the randomized controlled trials which show benefit is that the symptoms that get better with this diet strategy are abdominal pain and bloating. Um, some benefits for diarrhea, but not, not quite as durable or reliable. Also, uh, significant benefits for disease-specific quality of life as measured by the IBS QOL instrument. Um, uh, turning to medications, peppermint oil. Like it, this was alluded to actually in the case vignette, but peppermint oil is undergoing quite a renaissance right now as a treatment for a variety of disorders, including IBS. And it turns out that if you go back and call the literature, there are a whole bunch of studies which suggest that peppermint oil may offer benefits for IBS, presumably related to its antispasmodic properties. This is data from a, a, a recently published meta-analysis and systematic review showing benefits for global IBS symptoms, improvement in abdominal pain, uh, but at a cost there are an increased uh, likelihood of side effects, things like heartburn, uh, 
or for uncoated peppermint oil preparations, uh, uh, anal itching or burning. Um, and that's, that speaks to some of the benefits of enteric coating. Um, that reduces heartburn as well as anal itching or burning. How about opiate analogs? Well, there are a variety of different opiate analogs. Uh, the one I think most pe people are most familiar with is loperamide. And everybody's aware that this is a, 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 a mu opioid agonist that benefits stool frequency and consistency. What you may or may not have heard, um, sadly, uh, so first thing to say is with regard to loperamide is that at usual doses, it's remarkably safe. It has very poor penetration to the blood-brain barrier, does not lead to CNS side effects. But if you take very high doses very frequently, you can get CNS-related side effects. And there have been reports of use of the drug at high doses and frequent dosing for the reasons of abuse. So um, FDA recently released a warning uh, about um, high dose frequent use of loperamide. Diphenoxalate and diphenoxine uh, are very similar chemi or chemically and structurally related drugs that are usually combined with atropine, and that's because these drugs penetrate the blood brain barrier much more um, effectively than does loperamide. And there is clearly a potential for abuse with these drugs, but the atropine, of course, um, reduces that likelihood. The most common side effects with these drugs constipation crampy abdominal pain, nausea. Um, not a whole lot of studies in IBS. Some benefit for uh, stool frequency and consistency, not as much for pain, bloating, or overall symptoms. Um, the prescription alternative for, in, for, in terms of opioid, um, uh, opioid modulation is eluxadiline. Remember that eluxadiline has mixed effects at, at opioid receptors. So it's a mu agonist like loperamide it's a kappa agonist, and it's a delta antagonist. And that combination of effects is thought to reduce the likelihood of developing tolerance as well as enhancing the benefits for visceral pain. Um, uh, there have been two large phase three randomized controlled trials which have been conducted with eluxadiline in patients with IBSD, published by Tony Lembo in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, now uh, a couple of years ago, showing benefits. Benefits uh, for overall symptoms, including um, abdominal pain and stool consistency, as well as for the individual symptoms of IBSD. And you can see that there uh, is a statistically significant difference, about 26, 27 percent, uh, up to a third uh, get better with eluxadiline therapeutic gain over placebo in the range of 10 to 12 percent. Um, eluxadiline overall is a very well-tolerated drug. The most common side effect, not surprisingly, for a diarrhea-related drug is constipation. Um, nausea also more common uh, with this drug than with placebo. Um, however, the, the, the side effects that have gotten the most attention, create the most concern, are abdominal pain and elevated liver or pancreatic enzymes, felt to represent either sphincter vodi dysfunction or acute pancreatitis. And remember that this drug should not be used in individuals that have had a cholecystectomy who are, are drinking more than three alcoholic beverages uh, uh, per day or have a, any history of um, pancreatic, biliary, or, or liver-related disease. Uh, Alocitron is a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, so a serotonin receptor antagonist. This drug, of, of course, has been knocking around for quite a long time and has been has undergone multiple studies, all showing benefits. Uh, in fact, this is one of the most studied drugs uh, for IBSD. Uh, the indication is for severe refractory IBSD in women. Uh, and there, uh, again, multiple studies showing clear benefits for overall symptoms and individual symptoms, and in, in particularly in women with IBSD. Uh, the dosage is 0 0.5 milligrams taken twice daily. Uh, uh, and there is a, uh, a risk management program that it's less rigorous than it used to be. Uh, but and the reason for this risk management program is because of an increased risk of dose-dependent constipation and idiosyncratic ischemic colitis. Okay, so the good news is the event rates for ischemic colitis are very low, but it does occur more commonly in patients taking this drug than placebo. And it's idiosyncratic. It's not dose-related.
Um, so uh, another, an alternative is ondansetron. You're all very familiar with this drug, which we commonly use for the treatment of nausea. It turns out it's also very good at controlling diarrhea and to a lesser extent benefiting abdominal pain. The main benefits for ondansetron in, in this clinical tri trial by Gerset and colleagues from the UK was for um, stool frequency and consistency, but some benefits for abdominal pain. By the way, there's also a study with a new formulation of ondansetron being presented at DDW this year, again showing benefits of ondansetron versus placebo for patients with IBSD. Ramosetron is another 5-HT3 receptor antagonist, not available in the United States, but um, pretty commonly utilized in the Far East, particularly Japan. Um, again, multiple randomized controlled trials showing the benefits of ramosetron for overall IBS symptoms as well as individual IBS symptoms. How about probiotics? Well, certainly patients love probiotics, and uh, the probiotic trend in the United States remains incredibly popular, not only for IBS, but virtually everything, GI and non-GI related. And there are multiple studies evaluating multiple probiotics, and bottom line is when you put them all into a meta-analysis, there appears to be benefits offered by, by probiotics for patients with IBS. A uh, number needed to treat around seven, a number needed to harm of 35, so overall in the data that we have, these uh, probiotic supplements look very, very, very safe. Um, unfortunately, we don't have data which would allow us to make specific recommendations for probiotic supplements. So I can tell you that while probiotics overall appear to offer some benefit, it's hard for me to recommend a specific probiotic, probiotic supplement to you for your patients with IBS. We can certainly talk about that during the question and answer period. Rifaximin, a, a poorly absorbed broad spectrum antibiotic, uh, now, multiple studies showing benefits for short, a short course of rifaximin in patients with IBSD. Um, this is data from the two large phase three trials published in the New England Journal um, showing benefits for adequate relief of IBS symptoms as well as bloating in patients with IBSD. And the most recent data from Tony Limbo and colleagues published in Gastroenterology showing that up to two retreatments in patients with recurrent symptoms after initial benefit with rifaximin um, continues to offer benefits in patients with IBSD. Another thing just to know about uh, rifaximin, which I think is reassuring, is the adverse event profile in the short term looks very similar um, to, to placebo. Uh, also, um, the effects on the microbiome appear to be minimal and transient. What we don't know is for in patients that get multiple courses of rifaximin, whether there's an impact on the microbiome, and those studies are ongoing at the current time. Um, finally, talking about bile acid sequestrants, so bile acid binding resins. We alluded to this earlier. This, this whole area is making a, 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 a quite a renaissance in, in IBSD. First, we know that up to a third, 20 to 30 percent, of patients with IBSD have evidence of bile acid malabsorption. We also know that patients with evidence of bile acid malabsorption are much more likely to benefit from a bile acid binding resin, so drugs like cholestyramine or cholesphalam, for example. Uh, antidepressants, multiple studies with antidepressants. The best studied group, of course, are tricyclic antidepressants, which would be most appropriate for patients with IBSD, but SSRIs have also been extensively studied uh, because of their prokinetic effects. Uh, probably best suited for patients with IBSC. Remember as well, um, because of their sedating effects, IBSD very good for insomnia. Uh, because of their anxiolytic effects, SSRIs probably better for uh, patients that have a lot of comorbid anxiety. So uh, I'm going to turn this over to Brooks and, and let him take it on to the next uh, next case. Thank you. And you know, I wanted to go back to Karen for just a second, and you know, I want to kind of circle back and talk about your diagnosis of IBS. When did that finally occur? You said you, you saw about five different providers. When did somebody finally give you the diagnosis of IBS? So I, I was about 35, 36 years old, and uh, it was in, in Yuma, Arizona, and I had a colonoscopy, I had an endoscopy, and at the end of that, all of those came back without any issues. And so the provider told me, um, the gastroenterologist told me that because I didn't have anything that I likely had IBS. 
So basically, you said, you can't find anything else, so therefore it must be IBS. Yes. And how yeah. confident did you feel once that, so A, a diagnosis of exclusion <laughs> still. Right. And, and did that fill you with confidence? Were you happy to finally have a diagnosis? Or how did you feel about the, just the way that that transpired? And I was glad to know that it wasn't anything serious, but in the back of my mind, I wondered if perhaps there was something, but there just isn't a test yet, or the doctor hadn't run the right test on me, so I left feeling good that I didn't have anything well known, but I still wondered if, if there was something that was missing. And I think that underscores what Bill was saying with regards to you know, the methods that we use to diagnose irritable bowel syndrome. Of course, this, some of the, the data and some of the guidelines and recommendations that he put forth or, or told you all about post-dated Karen's experience, but I think that really has a big, a big issue, a big impact on just the, the way that our patients interact with us and, and are filled with confidence. Bill, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. I think that the way you present the diagnosis to patients with IBS is, is, hu is hugely important. So there's a big difference between saying to somebody, um, we've done you know, comprehensive testing and you don't have any of these diseases, therefore you must have IBS, as opposed to your symptoms, uh, your symptoms are consistent with the diagnosis of IBS. Uh, you know, there, there's lots of research to suggest that patients with these symptoms, um, with these diagnostic tests, um, have this specific diagnosis. Here's the reason why this occurs, particularly in this case, related to the acute infection. Um, so the way that it's presented makes a huge difference in regards to what the patient takes away which is, you know, in the first case, uh, I'm really not sure what your diagnosis is, but what I can tell you is that you don't have this. As opposed to you have this diagnosis, we feel confident about it because the testing supports that diagnosis. Um, I think my suspicion is that's probably a very different message. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, I, I did initially leave believing that perhaps irritable bowel syndrome wasn't actually a a disease, you know, that it was more just a kind of catch-all that we tell the patients that we don't know. And so for a while, I didn't actually relate or associate to that group because I just, I felt like perhaps we were kind of misfits and it wasn't real and that I still had an issue that I needed to, um, to resolve, which I did because I didn't actually leave with a treatment plan either. Yeah, and I suspect a lot of the burden about discovering what IBS really was fell to you. Right, yep. yeah. Yeah, which I think, you know, the, the more adept we are at describing what IBS is, as well as, as its sequelae or lack of sequelae, but just in terms of the impact of the condition would make a big difference in terms of, of your care. Were you on any therapies during this time while you were being evaluated? Did, would you get any empiric therapy or were you just trying to manage your symptoms on your own? I was just trying to manage the symptoms on my own. So yeah, um, probiotics, that was something that I found once I started um, school and learning more about nutrition. Mm -hmm. These are all things that I learned and um, looking online as well and managing it myself. Yeah, and that's, again, that's another thing that I would really want to underscore is, is I think we're doing our patients a disservice when when we're not proactive about describing certain medications to them or alternatives, and they don't have to be prescription medicines. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, we are talking primarily about prescription therapies, but there are numerous OTC therapies, some of which Bill talked about, and also lifestyle modifications. But, you know, really working with our patients to, to uh, try and improve their symptoms and their quality of life. Well, let's move on to Ms. Tran. She's a 34-year-old patient who is referred from her primary care physician for hard stools with straining. So now we're going to talk about the other extreme. Uh, and she's had these symptoms for three to four years. And she also had a colonoscopy about three years ago that was normal. So let's go to this video and uh, watch the interview with Ms. Tran. Hello, Ms. Tran. I'm Dr. Che. Very nice to meet you. Hello, Dr. Che. I understand that you've been experiencing constipation. I'd like to get a little more information about your symptoms. How often are you moving your bowels? Um, maybe every two to three days. And what's the consistency of your stool? I would say hard. It's probably lumpy sometimes, but mostly very hard, like little marbles. I try to eat things that might soften it, but changing my diet doesn't seem to make much of a difference. My primary care doctor suggested that I add more fiber to my diet, drink more water, but 
Like I said, it didn't really help or hurt. After a bowel movement, do you feel like you've completely emptied? Um, that's a strange question. <laughs> no one's ever really asked me that before. Um, let me think about it for a second. You know, come to think of it, no, I often don't really feel completely empty. More common than people think. How about pain? Are you experiencing any abdominal pain when you go to the bathroom? Yes, I do have pain. The pain is in my lower abdomen. Okay, once you move your bowels, does the pain get better? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I always expect to find relief, but sometimes it actually gets worse once I go. And how often does the pain occur? I would say once or twice a week. I don't know if that seems like a lot, but to me, it seems like a lot. And how long has this been going on for in general? About three or four years. Do you smoke or drink alcohol? No, to the smoking. I would consider myself a social drinker though. Wine relaxes me, but I never drink more than just a few glasses. I see that your doctor, from your doctor's notes that you're taking an SSRI. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? Well, I've had issues with anxiety since I was in college. Dr. Lockman thought that the constipation might be related to my anxiety. I'd been taken off my SSRI for a while, but he thought it might make sense to go back on. And how about over-the-counter laxatives? Yes, I've tried a few different brands from the drugstore. Honestly though, the bloating and cramping that I got with all of them was not worth it. The pain was just as bad, if not worse, than what the constipation was. One other thing that I want to bring up. I'm really worried that this might be something other than constipation. When I'm going through the pain, you know how you like naturally hold your abdomen? Well, when I push on it, it doesn't feel normal. It feels like there's a mass or something in there and it scares me. When I told Dr. Lockman about it, he said that at this point it's beyond what he could diagnose and that it might be time for me to take this to the next step and that's why I'm here. Well, rest assured, we're gonna do what we need to do to understand exactly what's causing the problems and find a plan to help you with these symptoms. We're finished here. Let's move to the other room and, and do a physical examination. Okay. Okay, so there's going to be a couple of points that I'm going to highlight from that video that, uh, that, that Dr. Shea did that really, I think, will enhance the way that we diagnose uh, patients with IBS. So, but first, we have an audience response question for you all. What diagnosis would you make, based on the information you just saw, for Ms. Tran? Would you give her... Uh, a diagnosis of A, chronic idiopathic constipation, B, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, C, pelvic floor dysfunction, D, slow transit constipation, or perhaps you're not sure, vote E for that choice. All right, so about three-quarters of you say irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, and about 10% roughly uh, CIC, and a similar number said uh, you're not sure. Bill, what do you think about that? I, I think that's right. Um, you know, it's always confusing, and, and you know, parsing between IBSC and CIC can be difficult, particularly, you know, given the fact that you really only got a little snippet of history. Um, so, but, you know, this, this woman um, reports fairly regular episodes of abdominal pain uh, in association with, with constipation. So that would be consistent with the diagnosis of IBSC. Yeah. And, you know, and those of you, or the, maybe the one or two of you that voted for uh, slow transit constipation may not be wrong. So these are not mutually exclusive and, and will highlight the fact that, that the labels that we give these patients with constipation especially, irritable bowel syndrome versus chronic idiopathic constipation, are really on a continuum uh, based on the presence of pain. But there's also overlap syndromes, such as pelvic floor dysfunction and slow transit constipation. They can still be present, although they require additional investigation. Let's go to another question. I, oops, sorry about that. Uh, what would you do next in Ms. Tran? Would you A, increase her over-the-counter laxatives, B, increase her fluid intake, uh, eight glasses of water per day or fluid. C, perform anal rectal manometry. Uh, D, perform a colonic transit test. Or E, for you're not sure where to go with Ms. Tran. Uh, 
Okay. So most of you said perform a colonic transit test. And that's a, I think that's actually a very fascinating uh, answer based on what we've seen with Ms. Tran in terms of her, her clinical history. Bill, what do you think in terms of this choice? Well, there's really no right or wrong answer here. Um, I, I, I personally would try to really take a detailed history in regards to what the patient's tried up to this point and probably try um, another laxative regimen, whether it be an OTC or a prescription medication, uh, before I went to physiologic testing. But I, I certainly can't fault anybody for wanting to um, do some physiologic testing um, you know, at this time. One, one thing I'd say, though, is that um, if you're going to do physiologic testing, you're probably better off evaluating the pelvic floor before you do a colon transit test. Because here's the thing. If a patient has pelvic floor dysfunction, they, that can cause an abnormal colon transit test, right? So, so if you're going to think about going down the route of doing colon transit testing, you should at least do a digital rectal examination first to, a, to screen for pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, if not, do a balloon expulsion test or anal rectal manometry. Um, because the problem is if you, if you go this route and you do the colon transit test and it comes back as abnormal, you're not going to know whether that truly reflects delayed or slow colon transit or is simply a reflection of pelvic floor dysfunction. So one, that would be the one, one caveat that I would offer. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. And, and I want to address the second choice, increasing fluid intake. There is actually virtually no data that increasing fluid intake has any effect on stool form or frequency. There's a little bit of data in a geriatric population, but uh, in our ambulatory young population like uh, Ms. Tran, all we were going to do is, is increase her urinary output, and we're, unless it's in conjunction with fiber or bulking agents or perhaps a, an osmotic laxative. So we've highlighted uh, number, choice number one as the most uh, likely beneficial therapy at this point or next intervention. Now that may fail and we may have to move on to prescription therapies or additional diagnostics. So Bill's absolutely right. There's no exactly right answer here, but there certainly is an order or a hierarchy in terms of likelihood of benefiting her uh, that we would recommend. So this speaks to that concept of differentiating CIC or chronic idiopathic constipation from irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And the other point that I would highlight from this slide is that the same uh, rules and, and uh, descriptions apply to diarrhea as well. There are people that we encounter in clinical practice with functional diarrhea. And that's analogous, although at the other extreme, to chronic idiopathic constipation. And what we mean by functional diarrhea or functional constipation or CIC is that predominant stool form and frequency and or frequency without a significant burden of abdominal pain. And when patients like Ms. Tran describe this abdominal pain that's related to their bowel habits uh, or their abnormal bowel habits, that falls more towards the irritable bowel syndrome uh, label. But it is largely semantic and it may very well be on a, a spectrum um, and there may even be the same etiologies or similar etiologies to these various uh, labels that we give our patients. So um, I would encourage you to, to think about these all in kind of a, a continuum and really in the same sphere. Bloating and distension are also very common symptoms in both groups of patients, both constipated patients as well as uh, patients with irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. So here are the Rome 4 criteria for CIC. Now, you, what you'll notice here is that abdominal pain is not listed on this slide. In fact, uh, patients should not fulfill those criteria for irritable bowel syndrome that Bill went over, and the primary symptom of IBS is abdominal pain related to those abnormal, uh, that abnormal stool form and stool frequency. The other thing that I want to point out is you'll notice that a lot of these questions were asked by Dr. Shea during that interview, and this is critically important. What we're taught in, in our training is that constipation equals less than three bowel movements per week. And that is true in terms of just normative values with regards to um, normal stool patterns. But the other questions that he asked, the sense of incomplete evacuation, the, what's the stool form like, uh, does she have a sense of, of uh, anal rectal obstruction? Sometimes we'll ask, and we should ask, whether 
patients have to use manual maneuvers to facilitate defecation. And this is often something that there's a, a real reticence for patients to describe to us. They don't want to tell us that they actually have to put their fingers uh, in their perineum or even in their rectum to facilitate uh, defecation. So asking those questions, and these are often much more important to patients than their stool infrequency. So asking these other questions is, is very important. Patients for the CIC should have at least two of these symptoms at least 25% of the time with defecation. And of course, as I mentioned, shouldn't meet the criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. So we will go back to Ms. Tran and look at her clinical course. She said that she had experimented with laxatives and she had had some adverse events and side effects from those, wasn't exactly pleased with them. But, uh, you know, as in further investigation, we figured, we found that she really had, had kind of just tickled the tip of the iceberg with regards to the, the dosing that she was using, a very low dose of a bulking laxative because she was hesitant to push those dosing limits. So we did recommend an osmotic laxative with her, and we said, okay, we want you to follow up in about four weeks. And that's another critically important aspect of uh, the care of these patients is that continued follow-up and, and reassessment. And in her next visit, she reported little change. So even though we tried that, it didn't do what we wanted it to do. So we're gonna have to escalate therapy for her. Now this slide uh, really highlights the points that we were making earlier. Thinking outside the box, I don't know if I would necessarily start doing physiologic tests just yet uh, in Ms. Tran, but do think about, especially in those patients that don't respond to your initial therapies or over-the-counter therapies, concepts like slow transit constipation, which is, as Bill mentioned, quite rare. Less than probably 5% of patients with constipation actually have colonic inertia or delayed colonic transit, and we can get fooled if we don't assess the pelvic floor. Pelvic floor or evacuation disorders much more common than slow transit constipation. Some estimates as high as 20, 25% of people with constipation may suffer from some degree of pelvic floor dysfunction. The other large group uh, is normal transit constipation. That's the majority of patients with constipation symptoms, whether it's CIC or IBSC. Their transit is normal and their pelvic floor is normal. Bill alluded to digital rectal examination. If this is something that you don't routinely do in your practice, you should. This can actually have a very good discriminatory power to evaluate for pelvic floor dysfunction or dysinert, pelvic floor dysinergia. And this is a study uh, from about 2010. Satish Rao has published similar findings showing that when we do a digital rectal examination, we actually can uncover or get some clues that there may be dysfunction with regards to the pelvic floor and a relatively good sensitivity. Importantly, the positive predictive value is quite high, 97% uh, in this study, and, and a pretty good negative predictive value as well. Now, we're going to follow this up if we have an inkling that the pelvic floor is not behaving normally follow this up either with balloon expulsion testing or anal rectal manometry or defecography. Some experts recommend that we have to do at least two of these tests to actually have a competent diagnosis of pelvic floor dysfunction. Uh, and we'll talk about the treatment of this subtype uh, or etiology of, of constipation in just a moment. Bill alluded to this as well, and this is not meant to be a hierarchy because this actually, this slide contradicts in some degree what he said, but the concept here is that when we test for delayed colonic transit, we also need to test for pelvic floor dysfunction, and that's the concept that we're trying to get across here. You can look at, at colonic transit in a number of different ways. SITS marker studies, which are very easy to do. Uh, you have a patient take a, a, a capsule with radiopaque markers and then get a plain film at some point uh, after that. Some people use five days, other, there's other recipes for that. You can also use a wireless pH motility capsule uh, to assess GI transit. In terms of uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, I mentioned a couple of tests, balloon expulsion testing or anal rectal manometry or defecography. You can also even do um, MR studies to look for that. But you wanna do these tests in concert before you say when the patient has delayed colonic transit, you really do have to look at the pelvic floor. And there can be overlap with these different etiologies. And that's the key point of thinking about these alternative causes of constipation. Because if you identify somebody with pelvic floor dysfunction, that treatment is going to uh, radically be different than how you might treat somebody with delayed transit or normal transit. And 
it can actually prevent patients from getting better. We can give all the laxatives in the world to somebody, but if they have pelvic floor dysfunction and we don't address that, then we're doing them a disservice. So realize that there can be overlap and there are a number of different tests, but you have to look at these, look for these in concert. Let's talk about medical therapy now. We're really gonna be focusing on the prescription therapies for uh, just the symptom of constipation, both IBSC as well as CIC. There is data available for both of those diagnoses with a number of different uh, prescription therapies. And the first that we'll talk about, and we kind of are doing this in their, their life cycle, lubiprostone's uh, among the three therapies that are FDA approved in the US for these conditions, it's the oldest. Remember, this is a non-absorbable gastrointestinal targeted bicyclic functional fatty acid. It's a prostaglandin derivative, and it selectively activates type 2 chloride channels in the gut. We believe primarily in the colon, but also perhaps in the small bowel to some degree. There is some evidence based on animal models that there may even be uh, some effect on the restoration of tight junction integrity, and that may actually have some, uh, some impact or some uh, relevance with regards to the improvement in abdominal pain in patients with irritable bowel syndrome. There's two doses that are commonly used. There's the IBS dose, which is the uh, eight micrograms twice a day. Remember, it's only indicated for adult women uh, in terms of irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And then the uh, CIC or opioid-induced constipation dose, which is 24 micrograms twice a day. Let's look at some of the clinical trial data with regards to lubiprostone. In this case, we're looking at its indication for irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And this is actually a post hoc analysis that was done. Bill was one of the authors on this. This was published in uh, AP&T about two years ago. Now, when this study was originally done, they used a more global endpoint. But what they did with this analysis was they went back and, and looked at the data as if the, the study was being done uh, contemporaneously or, or, or currently, which basically they use the, the newer FDA-approved and mandated uh, composite endpoint responder definition, which is an improvement not only in abdominal pain by about 30%, which is judged to be clinically relevant, but also a concomitant improvement in uh, bowel movement frequency. And what you can see here is that lubiprostone performs really very consistently uh, better than placebo, even for patients who have more severe abdominal pain. So on the left, patients have less severe baseline abdominal pain. Out to the right, more severe baseline abdominal pain. And then you see a very consistent benefit uh, with lubiprostone compared to placebo. And there's a whole host of other uh, symptoms that also improve with lubiprostone for irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. Now, CIC data with regards to lubiprostone, this is looking specifically at uh, spontaneous bowel movement frequency, stool consistency, straining, and overall constipation severity. And again, you can see at the dose of 24 micrograms twice a day, so this is three times the dose of the previous study that we looked at, that there's a consistent improvement relative to placebo for those outcomes with lubiprostone. What about safety? Well, the primary adverse event that's seen with uh, lubiprostone has been diarrhea, of course, but also nausea. And now, the, with regards to the nausea, this is often very mild. Um, and what they found as a result of some of, the, some of these studies that we just went over is that it's much better to advise patients to take lubiprostone in a fed state. The CIC studies were done in a fasted state, and you see the rates of nausea were significantly higher when lubiprostone was admitted, admit, was, it was given as uh, in a fasted state, as opposed to a fed state. There may be a dose relationship as well. In clinical practice, I don't think uh, nausea has been a major issue for most of us since we've started using, uh, using it in a fed state, and certainly the lower doses may also ameliorate that. But most patients tolerate this uh, therapy very well. Now, we'll switch and talk about a different class of therapies, and, the, and these three drugs that we're talking about, lubiprostone, linaclotide, and then placanotide uh, after this, all fit into the new category that we call secretagogues. But linaclotide and placanotide are distinctly different than lubiprostone. These are GCC agonists, and linaclotide was the first of, of uh, these GCC agonists to come on the market. What these agents do is they bind to the GCC or guanylate cyclase C receptor. And these receptors are located ubiquitously throughout the GI tract. Uh, 
primarily small intestine and colon. Uh, these are non-absorbed peptides that bind to the GCC receptor and cause an accumulation or an elevation of cyclic GMP within the enterocyte. That cyclic GMP is really the effector molecule. It does a number of different things. We know that it opens up various chloride channels, most importantly, the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator. It also appears to have some effect on the visceral afferent neurons. So it exits the basolateral aspect of the enterocyte, and in animal studies has shown that it may actually have some pain relieving qualities uh, in terms of mitigating uh, that, those, neuronal, uh, those neuronal inputs. So two doses for uh, linaclotide as well, 290 micrograms once a day for IBSC in adults and 145 micrograms once a day for CIC in adult patients. And that's an important point to, to highlight is these two therapies, linaclotide and then placanotide that we'll talk about in just a second, should only be used in adults. There's actually a boxed warning about using uh, these agents in pediatric populations because of the risk of diarrhea based on animal models. So here's uh, several, or this is actually the a compendium of uh, the phase three trials with linaclotide in irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And what we're looking at here is individual symptoms of abdominal pain, that's on top. And again, it's that 30% improvement or greater. That's what the FDA and the pain literature, more importantly, supports as a clinically relevant improvement in abdominal pain. You can see that about 50% of patients in these trials had that degree, at least, of improvement in their abdominal pain for at least half the days out of the trial. They also had, about 50% of them, had an increase uh, by at least one complete spontaneous bowel movement per week from baseline for at least six out of 12 weeks. So those two individual <coughs> symptoms certainly are much better than placebo in these trials. And when we combine them, and this is the FDA-approved uh, composite endpoint, we continue to see that statistically significant benefit relative to placebo for that combined endpoint, so abdominal pain at the same time that the bowel movements are improved, and, and to a degree of about 20%, so that translates into a number needed to treat of about five. Now, if we look at CIC, or chronic idiopathic constipation, and linaclotide, we also see improvement. <laughs> this is looking at both doses. Uh, the IBS studies only looked at the 290 microgram dose, but the CIC studies, and this is the first indication for linaclotide, looked at both, both doses of linaclotide, and you can see that there's really a very similar clinical response between the 145 microgram dose and the 290 microgram dose. So for that reason, the FDA said, let's go with the lower dose in terms of that approval or that indication for CIC, but remarkably better than uh, placebo in terms of the primary endpoint here, which is at least three uh, complete spontaneous bowel movements and an increase by at least one of, of those uh, types of bowel movements for 75% of the time in these trials. Now, if we talk about safety with regards to linaclotide, the primary adverse event that was noticed in these uh, phase three trials was diarrhea. And the rates were reportedly quite high, 20%, 16% in these trials. Again, similar to lubiprostone and the nausea that, that we observe with lubiprostone, this, is, this can be a single episode or perhaps one day of diarrhea. In clinical practice, what we often will find is that patients may have a very short-lived or transient episode of, of looser stools that they perceive as diarrhea but that, that really attenuates and they tolerate this medication quite well. Certainly there will be some patients that do experience diarrhea that will have to stop this therapy and, and uh, they're very dissatisfied with that, but it's n we're not seeing dose limiting or treatment limiting diarrhea to the degree that was implicated in the clinical trials. So just keep that in mind as well. Now I mentioned placanotide a couple of times. This is another GCC agonist. This is the newest GCC agonist and it has important differences with regards to linaclotide in terms of its mechanism of action. It does the same thing. It's a GCC receptor agonist, but uh, placanotide is thought to have a pH selective receptor binding. And what I mean by that is it binds to that GCC receptor uh, much more avidly at a lower pH. And then within the GI tract, the pH is lower primarily within the small bowel. So it's thought that placanotide primarily binds to the GCC receptor in the small bowel and has much less effect in the colon. 
the theoretical advantage to that is that it may be associated with low rates of diarrhea in terms of its adverse events. There's one dose with regards to placanotide, and that's a three milligram once a day dose for both of these indications. And if we look at the clinical trial data for placanotide, we see something that looks very similar to the data that we saw with linaclotide. The endpoint here is slightly different than the linaclotide studies, um, but again, looking at two different doses, three milligrams as well as six milligrams, you can clearly see that there's an improvement that is statistically significantly different than placebo uh, for that composite endpoint responder definition, 30% improvement in pain, as well as a concomitant uh, improvement in stool frequency for these patients. Now, because there wasn't a remarkable difference between three milligrams and six milligrams, the FDA approved that three milligram dose uh, for this indication. If we look at uh, chronic idiopathic constipation and placanotide, this, uh, this slide demonstrates the change in complete spontaneous bowel movements. That term implies that it's a bowel movement without the use of a laxative in which the patient feels completely evacuated. That's a, a high quality uh, bowel movement and a satisfying bowel movement for patients. And that's what patients want with these conditions. You can clearly see that both doses of placanotide were statistically significantly different over the course of the trial versus placebo. And at the end, when placanotide is discontinued, patients have a recurrence or they return towards baseline and, and approach uh, what's being experienced in patients with uh, who are taking placebo. And that implies that there really is an effect of this medication. So safety with regards to this, there's, there's, it's a very well-tolerated medication, and the diarrhea rates are low, about 4 to 5 percent in these trials versus 1 percent with placebo. Now, this has not been compared head-to-head -head with the other GCC agonists, so we can't say with any degree of uh, confidence that there's a significant difference between these two therapies and their tolerability because they haven't been compared head to head. A couple of emerging therapies for uh, constipated related syndromes, in this case, a medication called tenapenor, and Bill's done most of the research uh, that's been uh, presented with regards to this agent in the United States. This is a sodium hydrogen exchanger, uh, exchange ion 3 inhibitor. Uh, and in the doses, or the studies, the phase two studies that, that uh, Bill presented last year showed that tenapenor at a dose of 50 milligrams twice a day resulted in a significantly higher rate of complete spontaneous bone movement responders uh, versus placebo. And you can see that shown very clearly in the blue bar there versus the red bar with placebo. Most common adverse events were diarrhea and uh, headache, abdominal discomfort, but very well tolerated and moving on towards phase three investigation. So we may see this agent uh, approved or go before the FDA within the next couple of years based on uh, future and further studies. Prucalipride is a drug that many of us are aware of. Certainly, Kara may be aware of this from Canada. Uh, this drug is approved in Canada. It's also approved in the EU and many other uh, locales, but it's not approved in the United States. But this is a 5-HT4 receptor agonist. So similar to uh, Tegasrod, which was a 5-HT4 agonist. Uh, but the difference between this agent and Tegasrod is this has a very highly selective activity at that, that serotonin type 4 receptor. There's no known cardiac effects. This has been very well studied, and it is approved in other countries for the treatment of chronic idiopathic constipation, and there may be uh, some movement to bring this uh, to approval in the United States as well. So this is a, an emerging therapy that we may see in the near future. So biofeedback therapy. I, I spent a lot of time talking about pelvic floor dysfunction. This is the primary treatment for those patients that you discover with, who have uh, pelvic floor dysfunction or outlet obstruction. And this is just an example among many of trials looking at biofeedback therapy or pelvic floor retraining and how effective it can be. And importantly, this benefit is very often very durable, superior to any medication that we can use. And these, are, these patients frequently fail medications, and that's what I often will use as my impetus to do this type of testing. Again, thinking about having to look for um, slow transit as well. But do keep in mind that if you look for this and you find it, the preferred therapy is biofeedback and pelvic floor retraining. 
So with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to actually ask uh, Bill what his thoughts are, because this is an area, and, and also Karen, with regards to the microbiome. You know, this is a, a hot topic, especially more in the diarrheal range, but even in, in constipation. Obviously, you can tell from this slide, there's a whole bunch of theories. We alluded to probiotics earlier. Um, what do you think, Bill? Is there, is there a major, where are we with regards to the microbiome manipulating for these types of conditions? Well, it's certainly all the rage, isn't it? I mean, if you think about the therapies that we utilize for IBS nowadays, many of them um, are felt to target the microbiome, whether you're talking about probiotics, antibiotics, prebiotics, uh, which are looming very, you know, very much on the horizon, actually. Uh, as well as diet. Remember that diet is, um, at its heart, a microbiome-based strategy, or at least it's thought to be um, as well. All that being said, at the end of the day, Brooks and I were talking about this last night, and, and um, it's hard to specifically state uh, that these are absolutely microbiome strategies, and if they are microbiome-based strategies, um, what we're doing to the microbiome that's actually leading to the benefits for IBS symptoms. So it holds a lot of promise, but I think right now we're at a very early stage. I think the, other, I think the thing that we're most excited about, and I'm actually going to talk about this when I give the, the talk on IBS in the postgraduate course tomorrow, um, is the fact that we might be able to leverage the microbiome or metabolome Remember, the microbiome leads to the metabolome um, in a way that allows us to choose the right therapy for the right patient. So are there metabolomic or microbiome signatures that identify patients who are more or less likely to, to respond to microbiome-based strategies? Um, I think this is super exciting. I personally think that probably will turn out to be the case, but we're not there yet. It's very early times. Yeah, I would agree, and I think what we really need, and this, this, this really echoes what Bill said, is some sort of a biomarker, ideally, that would help us identify which patients, and then we've got to get smart about what type of manipulation we can use. Karen, did, did any of your providers ever talk to you about the microbiome or changing your diet or, or probiotics or anything like that? Um, the most, it was diet, and because I'm a registered dietitian, right. um, my physician just said, you know, you have the expertise so you can go about figuring out what works for you. Mm -hmm. And so while I would have appreciated, and I did work with um, other, my colleagues, to try and figure something out, um, it's always a process. But definitely, as we talked about last night, too, that interdisciplinary um, team and working, I do recommend um, sending patients to a registered dietitian or someone to truly get that what you said, the right, getting the right treatment, the right plan of action for the right patient, because symptoms are so different, and having that thorough nutrition history and trying to tie that nutrition history with episodes and seeing what, what they can find out and how they can help from that perspective. Yeah. Maybe that's a good segue, huh? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to finish up with just a com couple comments about this very point, you know, which I think is increasingly in vogue uh, in not only, by the way, in regards to the management of patients with functional GI disorders, but um, in complex care of patients with a whole range of different kinds of GI disorders, whether you're talking about inflammatory bowel disease, um, eosinophilic uh, esophagitis, or other esophageal disorders, there's a whole range of different pancreatic disease. Um, I, I think for the sake of Time. Should we go through this, or should we? I think we can. I think we can. We got time. Okay. Well, let's let's go through this and see what happens with Ms. Tran. Hello, Ms. Tran. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Dr. Shea. So, tell me, you've been on the medication now for six weeks. How are you feeling? Actually, pretty good. You know, when I started on the medication, I had some diarrhea, but honestly, it wasn't a big deal. It was a worthwhile trade-off, and it kind of worked itself out in three or four days. So, with that information, how often are you moving your bowels now? I'm moving my bowels daily now. And how about your abdominal pain? Oh, it's a lot better. In fact, I'm having almost no pain now. That's great to hear. Now that we're over that first hurdle, let's discuss some other things that might help you to keep on a more natural course in regards to your bowel habits. Okay. I think you might benefit from a discussion with one of our dietitians to give you some tips about your diet. I think that's a really good idea. Overall, I'm a pretty healthy eater. 
but I'd like to make sure that my definition of healthy is what's best to avoid constipation. Can I work through your office or do I need to go back through Dr. Lachman? I think we can help you with that. Just to let you know, we're in communication with Dr. Lachman, keeping him up to speed in regards to your diagnosis and also the treatment, including linaclotide that you're currently taking. I'd like to keep an open line of communication so that everyone's aware of what we're working on and agreeing upon together. Oh, good. I was wondering about that. Um, if okay with you, I'd like to see you again in four months during that time. It might be really helpful for you to keep track of your symptoms so that we can understand how you're doing um, with the ongoing therapy. Sure, okay, is there an app for that? Turns out there is an app for that. Um, there, there's an app called MyGI Health, which you can download from the App Store or from our website. Uh, our department here at the University of Michigan actually was instrumental in developing this particular app, which helps patients to assess their symptoms, track their symptoms over time, and receive education about their problems. Wow, that sounds really interesting. I'll download it and take a look. I think you'll find it helpful. There's some excellent educational tools uh, on, on the app or, and also on the website. I think it'll help us to make the visit a bit more efficient and productive. And you can either email me the information that you record about your symptoms uh, before your visit, or you can uh, print a copy and bring it to your visit. Cool, okay. It sounds like it could be a good tool for me. All right, let's, um, so um, a, a couple of, of comments uh, in regards to, to just thinking about managing patients with functional GI disorders. Uh, three components to uh, shared decision making here. Uh, first, making a clear, accurate, and, um, and providing unbiased medical advice about the various alternatives. You know, Brooks alluded to that. It's, I think it's really important to talk about the, the whole waterfront of different um, kinds of options. Of course, it's your job as a physician to really sort through that for the patient, but it helps to, to have several different options that you can present to the patient, and, um, you, and you and the patient together choose the, the right one for the patient. Um, clinical expertise uh, in communicating this tailored information uh, should really be individualized, and it should also incorporate uh, the patient's value, uh, the, the goals that they're trying to, to, to get out of the visit. It's really important to make sure that you understand what the patient is hoping to achieve um, in their visits with you. And, and also uh, um, taking into consideration uh, um, preferences and availability, like for example, um, as something we all deal with in the United States, um, issues around formulary availability and uh, insurance coverage. I think that increasingly we're going towards team-based care uh, in patients with functional GI disorders, and again, a whole wide range of diff di different types of disorders in GI. Uh, so not only including the um, physician, but also advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners and, and um, physician's assistants. And I think increasingly it's important to have participation from a registered dietitian. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a, a registered dietitian embedded in your group, but being aware of a registered dietitian in your area that has familiarity with um, interventions, diet-based interventions for GI is incredibly helpful. I can't tell you how helpful it is. Um, I, for those people that have found um, a, a dietitian to work with, I think a, almost to a one, we would say, um, it, it's hard to believe that we were able to practice before we had that asset available to us. Also, um, behavioral therapists, equally important. Remember, there's comparative effectiveness data showing that behavioral therapy with either hypnotherapy or cognitive behavioral therapy is just as effective as diet-based therapies or medical therapies. So behavioral therapy is another layer of interdisciplinary care that can be remarkably helpful. Again, you don't have to have a therapist that's embedded in your group, that's certainly ideal. But if you identify a therapist in the area that has an interest in, um, uh, in GI disorders and knows cognitive behavioral therapy, hypnotherapy, mindfulness, et cetera, that can be remarkably helpful. And of course, for um, patients with a, 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 a problems with like fecal incontinence or pelvic floor dys dysfunction, dyssynergic defecation, having a physical therapist as part of your team, or again, somebody that you can refer to, can really enhance your practice 
and make sure that you optimize outcomes for your patients with these types of complaints. Um, it's very important to follow your patients up and engage in ongoing um, uh, treatment. Uh, I think that's critically important. Karen, did, did your doctors follow up with you on, on these things or did they, did they pretty much tell you what you had and then send you on your way? The latter, yes. Really? Yeah. So um, I, I, I currently am not under the care of a gastroenterologist. However, seeing all of this, um, it's something that when I return, I'll probably reach out and see what's happened. But no, yeah. there's never been follow-up. And, and I did kind of give up on that part because um, I, just, I just figured I was just going to hear that I had to manage it myself. Now, your background's somewhat unique, right? you know, obviously. Yeah. Um, so putting that aside, as a patient, how useful would this have been to you? Oh. Uh, you know, do you think that would have made a big difference in your, in your journey as a patient? Because I heard yeah. several times it was, I had to educate myself, I had to kind of figure out what I wanted to do, I didn't get much guidance. Is this something that, you know, that sounds good, A, and B, you know, in practice, how much, how much impact would it have had, you think? I, well, definitely, I think it, there would have been an impact on quality of life, mm -hmm. um, especially from the pain perspective. I mean, there's, there's days where I've, I've, lots of days where I've had to leave work um, because of the pain and not being able to stay at work. So knowing that there are options, um, someone to work with, having a team behind me, um, I think that, yeah, my quality of life would have been significantly improved over the past few years, and if not my confidence level that there's something that I could do. And I would reiterate what Bill said, you don't have to be a functional GI center to be able to enact these things. You can do this in community practice, it's very mm -hmm. doable. The last thing I'll tell you about, by way of disclosure, just to let you know, um, you know, I'm one of the co-inventors of this particular tool, but I, th I think it provides an example of where we're going as a profession, and not just GI, but medicine in general. I think that increasingly we're going to be using digital tools to collect information um, before we ever see the patient in clinic, and also to follow patients over time. Uh, so one tool that we developed at University of Michigan in collaboration with um, the Cedar sinai group, Cedars-Sinai group, is a tool called My GI Health. This is a tool that actually utilizes the, the NIH-funded Promise questionnaires to collect information regarding the eight most common GI symptoms encountered in clinical practice. Um, uh, it actually provides a uh, color-coded heat map describing the patient's symptom experience for the user, and it also writes a history of present illness for the patient. So the patient answers questions, that information is integrated into a history of present illness, which can then be mailed to um, the physician uh, so that the physician has the HPI before they ever see you. That, um, from the physician's standpoint, that HPI can then be cut and pasted into your EMR. Um, uh, the other thing is that there's extensive educational materials, which are all free as part, by the way, the app is free. Uh, and, and in collaboration with the AGA, we have our own education materials as well as ed AGA's education materials on symptoms and diseases, which are freely available for patients on this, uh, this mobile app. Uh, so I think this is where we're headed. Uh, I think that we should all start to investigate the different types of tools that are out there and figure out which ones might best serve our needs in clinical practice. But you don't have to do everything yourself in the four walls of your clinic space. Nowadays, we can do a lot of the work virtually, a lot of the homework, uh, before we actually ever even see the patient in clinic. So with that, I think we'll stop and, and I'll, I'll let uh, Brooks close the program. Yeah, there is uh, just a couple of, uh, or really just one more slide. And then do, if you do have questions, please either enter them into, well, I enter them into your, your iPad, because um, we definitely would, would love to try to address any questions that you may have. But just to wrap everything up, these are, uh, to reiterate, the, the SMART goals, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely that we've talked about this morning. And that is, A, uh, making a confident diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome and CIC. Uh, you know, I think we heard uh, from Karen especially that, that that would have gone a long way in terms of improving her patient experience. And, and you, heard, you heard what she went through, saw five different providers, got multiple different tests, years of, of suffering without a diagnosis, and all the attendant anxiety and frustration that goes along with that. Applying the Rome 4 criteria with judicious uh, and appropriate diagnostic testing. Once the diagnosis is made, 
initiating evidence-based therapy. Typically, this is going to be in the form of over-the-counter therapy or lifestyle modifications, and we are getting additional information. And three, four, five years ago, we would have said, well, there's no evidence to support that, but we still do it. Now we actually, from people like Bill and other investigators, have evidence to support lifestyle modifications, dietary modifications, uh, over-the-counter therapies as well. But when those fail or when they're ineffective or not completely effective, we will often move up to pharmacologic uh, therapies uh, that are FDA approved for these indications. And we went over those therapies as well as some of the emerging therapies that hopefully we will be able to bring to bear in the near future. And then finally, promoting that interdisciplinary and collaborative uh, strategies and using uh, those other specialties and skill sets that are eminently available in both an academic environment, but also, importantly, in a community environment, and engaging patients. And, and this is where I really want to say thank you to Karen for, for being here, because I think it, she, you know, she puts a face to the condition. Um, and I think her, her input's been invaluable in terms of helping us understand how we need to engage patients in shared decision making, considering their preferences as well as their treatment goals, and understanding what uh, their fears and concerns are as well, and being able to address that in a comprehensive fashion. So thank you very much for being here this morning. And with that, uh, we have time for Q&A. I don't see any in the queue right now. Uh, so if anybody does have a question, please do send that in. But I, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you all coming in uh, for this symposium. It looks like we might have something coming up. So a question. It's not showing up on my iPad. Oh, we have a whole bunch of questions here. Okay, great. All right. So we only have a few minutes. We only have a few minutes, so we'll be quick. Um, breath testing, Bill. What do you think about breath testing? As it turns out, this afternoon at the postgraduate course, I'm giving a whole talk on breath testing. Um, and so uh, there are a variety of different breath tests. The primary ones have to do with identifying bacterial overgrowth. So those would be glucose and lactulose and then carbohydrate maldigestion or malabsorption. So those would be tests that look at things like lactose, fructose, and sucrose. Um, I think the breath tests are reasonable surrogates for bacterial overgrowth and, um, and, and carbohydrate maldigestion malabsorption with lots of caveats. So um, they're, they're clearly not without problems, um, but uh, there is emerging data to suggest that uh, a positive glucose or lactulose breath test um, increases the, or identifies patients who are more likely to respond to antibiotic therapy, for example. Mm -hmm. The role of, um, I, yeah, I think that the lactose breath test is a um, uh, pretty well accepted means by which to assess for lactose maldigestion. Um, uh, I think fructose is highly controversial uh, and sucrase isomaltase um, or sucrose breath testing, I think, is emerging, but we still have a lot to learn. Um, so that's sort of my take on breath testing. Okay. Uh, a couple more questions. So evidence for placanotide and constipation for patients on opioids. There is no evidence, hasn't been studied, um, but that certainly is an area that uh, would be ripe for research. Um, how do you differentiate normal transit from slow transit constipation on history? I think that can be very difficult. To, you know, our history is is not very good in terms of identifying etiologies, both slow transit as well as pelvic floor. There are some clues that I sometimes use, that I often will use in my practice. The digital manipulation uh, certainly highlights the, at least the possibility or an increased possibility in my mind uh, of pelvic floor dysfunction. In patients who come in and tell me that they go to, they have a bowel movement every two to three weeks, uh, which does happen, Sometimes I don't believe them, but sometimes I do. I think that can help differentiate, and I may be more prone to doing a marker study in those patients. Do you think there's any value in history, Bill? Yeah, there is, actually. So uh, the, the sort of take-home point is this is where the Bristol stool form scale can mm -hmm. really help you. Yeah. Um, so remember that stool frequency outside of what Brooks talked about, if somebody tells you that they're moving their bowels every two weeks, um, I can tell you they're going to have slow transit. But, um, uh, but most patients that are constipated actually move their bowels every day or every other day. So the stool frequency is normal. Um, uh, the, what, what seems to correlate better with colon transit is actually the Bristol stool form scale. So a Bristol stool form scale score of one to two predicts um, slow colon transit. Uh, 
So, uh, and also five to, or six to seven predicts fast colon transit. In regards to pelvic floor dysfunction, um, symptoms are really unreliable. Uh, what Brooks said is true, which is um, there is some data, although it's not great, uh, that to suggest that digital maneuvers identify patients more likely to have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, we, all, we have also found that patients that spend an excessive amount of time in the bathroom trying to move their bowels, so, and that specifically is more than five to 10 minutes, also have an increased likelihood of pelvic floor dysfunction. Here's a question for both of you because we're gonna we're gonna have you put on your dietitian hat. Um, so, do you have luck luck getting patients to adhere to FODMAP? I, I suspect the answer for Bill is yes. Um, but but what what can they do? What can our audience do to increase the that uh, chance of adherence? Well, I, I'd like to hear from Kara because we talked about this last night, and I was a little surprised at at, at, at what we talked about. But I but again, it may be. It, it may simply reflect familiarity and, and resources, but, but tell, you talked, we talked about this last night. Like, yeah. you, what did you think about low FODMAP? Um, I do, when patients adhere to it, it does improve symptoms. It's just in my experience, experience of my colleagues as well, just long-term adherence um, to the diet, just the patients seem to kind of fall off. Yeah. Um, I think especially too, once you start which is probably like all of us, once you start seeing some improvement, then you feel like you can go back to what you were doing or not being as strict as you were before. But patients do consistently report that once they've been on it, that they do start to feel, and myself included, but I'm also one of those ones that kind of dies off as well. Yeah, and I think the, this is a really important point. So um, we, I showed you data, and there's, there is, you know, credible data now to suggest that the elimination period is associated with benefits, particularly for pain and bloating. Realize that the elimination period only needs to be two to six weeks, okay? You shouldn't be on the full elimination for longer than two to six weeks. After that two to six weeks, two to six week period, if a person responds, they should undergo a structured reintroduction of foods containing FODMAPs to determine their individual FODMAP triggers and a lot, which allows them to diversify their diet. We treated thousands of patients with this diet at this point. Um, we, were pro we were the first institutional adopter of the diet in the United States, started probably 2008. Um, and our data suggests that probably 80, 85% of the patients that respond to that two to six week elimination are able to diversify their diet through reintroduction. So remember that the diet is three phases. So elimination, um, and I, the acronym we've coined is ESP. So elimination, determine sensitivities, which is the S, personalize your diet, which is P. So ESP, eliminate, determine sensitivities, personalize. Um, and, it, and you really need to go through all three phases um, to address exactly the points that have been made because it's, it's, re it's really hard to stay on the, and yeah. it's, to be honest with you, it may be unhealthy to yeah. do that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot of risk data with regards to these restriction diets. Um, in fact, I just was, was privileged enough to, to be able to write a, an article um, that Bill commissioned with regards to the risk of, of uh, the gluten-free diet in patients who don't have celiac disease. Mm -hmm. And I was really hard-pressed to find, you know, hard outcomes with regards to adverse events. There's even less with regards to FODMAP, but it's at least conjecture that there may be micronutrient deficiencies or even macronutrient deficiencies from these restrictive diets. So that just highlights the point that it's not meant to be a long-term diet until we get some data suggesting that it actually is safe and, and not harmful in that respect. Um, but there is abundant data demonstrating the benefit in patients. So with that, I think we'll close. I apologize if we didn't get to your question, but I do want to thank you all for attending. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day and a great conference. Thank you.